What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. I know this is a much longer video than normal. Just wanted to let you guys know that it is all new stories. I just felt like recording a bit more than usual. Instead of labeling this like however many stories compilation or whatever, I thought about just labeling it like the other compilation videos, but instead of putting like horror compilation, putting like mega mix or something like that so you know it's new stories, uh, anything that's not on Sunday is always new stories, by the way. If you guys appreciate this much longer sort of video, please be sure to like, share, comment, or subscribe, as it really helps out the video to do well, and it will show me that you guys are interested in having more of this in the future. Uh, anyways, guys, without further ado, I will let you get right into the stories, and I hope you guys enjoy them. Have a great day. Several years ago, I was traveling for work by myself. I was on a bit of a road trip, which went through several different states. On the way back home, I was passing through some of South Dakota, where I had never been to before. I knew Mount Rushmore was somewhere around there, so I decided to go a little out of the way and take a view of it. I followed the directions to the park. I remember that I got there sometime in the afternoon. It was a little bit on the later side. I didn't have a lot of control over that, though. There was still enough daylight left that I should still get to see the park. It has a few different parking lots, and some are on different levels. I went to one lot that was on the top. There was a very quiet road with some trees on either side. There were a decent amount of other cars in the parking lot when I got there, but it wasn't packed or anything. After parking, I got out and walked over to the park. It wasn't that far of a walk, actually. I soon was able to see the mountain, and most of the other people were over there as well. I stayed in that area for a while, admiring the view and taking a lot of pictures. A large quantity of people started to head out not long after I got there, though, and before I knew it, I was one of the only people left in the area. The sun was swiftly setting as well. I decided to go back and hit the road. I left the park and walked back out to the parking lot. I remember that as I was walking over, I didn't really see anybody else around. It had seemed that most of the other people were going to the other lots on the other sides. When I reached the lot, my car was one of probably less than ten that were still there. As I was walking, something caught my eye. I also heard a noise coming from across the quiet road, just inside the wooded area. What I'd seen was a tree branch barely moving. I didn't really see anything else. I thought that there might be some kind of wild animal there. There were a lot of wild animals in that area, so I stopped and kept watching. I didn't see anything further. I was just about to continue when I saw a man step out. Of course, I thought this was weird, but what was even more strange was that the man started immediately moving toward me, and he was moving fast too. I started to walk faster, and soon made it to my car. When I was unlocking it and getting inside, I noted that the man was now sprinting in my direction. I started to panic a little. That made me get into the car even faster. When I had it all closed up, I immediately started the engine and began driving away. The man did not have the opportunity to reach my car. I looked around to try and see where he was, and just barely noticed him slipping out of sight of the parking lot, a ways away. I drove around to the exit, and then went out onto one of the quiet roads. The roads went through a sort of woods-like area, leading out of the park. You had to go pretty slow on them because they were so winding. I was driving slowly down this road, when about halfway to the park's exit, I saw the man emerging from the woods. He must have found a shortcut and really ran there or something. He ran straight out into the middle of the street. When I saw him, I had to slow down even further. However, I was able to slip around him 
and avoid impacting him. He just kind of stared at me as I passed by. I soon left the park. After that, I called and reported him for his suspicious behavior. I'm not sure who that guy was or what his specific plans were, but I'm sure it was nothing good. This story takes place when I went to Yellowstone National Park with some friends. Obviously, the park is massive, and there are hiking trails that you can go on. That's what my group was going to be doing on the day this story took place. We spent a total of three days in the area beforehand, and this was the final day there. There were seven of us total, so a decent group of people. We started hiking on one of the trails. I don't recall exactly which one it was, but it went through a lot of woods and by some streams and things like that. It was one of the best trails that I've ever been on, and I was really enjoying the experience. My group soon got really split up though. Everybody was kind of going at their own pace. Some people would stay back and look at something, while others kept on walking further ahead. I was one of the people that found myself getting caught in the back for a while. It was just me and two other people, with all of the others out of sight. We didn't think too much of it, though. At one point, I stopped to observe a stream. I thought that the other two were also stopping with me and looking at something, but I soon realized they didn't stop at all. They just kept on walking. So now, I was all by myself at the very back. Still, that wasn't that big of a deal. I thought I could catch right back up to them easily. I started walking on the path again, and walked at a faster pace so I would catch up with them. After the stream, the trail went through a more dense patch of woods. It was not that long into that portion, when I heard a strange noise up ahead. I couldn't be sure exactly what it was. Needless to say, I was very surprised when a woman suddenly emerged from the woods. I was confused by this. I didn't recognize her at all, and she was obviously not one of our group. She walked out kind of in front of me, and then asked me if I could help her with something. I asked her what was going on. She said that her friend needed some help, and then told me to follow her. She started walking back into the woods. I noticed she was following a very small trail leading deeper in. It didn't look like any kind of real trailhead. It was either an animal trail or had been caused by the woman walking back there. I didn't know what the situation was with her friend needing help, but I followed her out into the woods. It was pretty thick in there. We were going over rocks and tall grass. The visibility was not good at all. I kept following her, farther and farther into these woods. This went on for close to five minutes. I couldn't believe how far in we were going. It made me wonder why she was so far back here in the first place. Finally, we came upon a tiny clearing. The woman entered it, and I was about to as well. I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, though. There were two large men standing at the sides. They were wearing old white hockey goalie masks, the creepy looking ones. That was enough to make me instantly turn around and start running back. There was no friend needing help that I could see, or anything of the sort. Just two men laying in wait in masks. I didn't even think about it. I was just running as fast as I could. I was getting smacked by tree branches, scraping myself on rocks. I could hear somebody running after me. This caused me to go even faster. I'm not sure who was chasing me. If it was one of them or all of them, nobody was saying anything. We were just running for a while. I didn't stop, and luckily I was in pretty good shape. I run daily for exercise, so I was able to not have to stop at all until I got back to the regular trail. By that point, I didn't really hear them still chasing after me. When I made it back to the trail, I ran in the direction my friends had gone. 
Just moments later, I saw one of them coming back in my direction. My friend had been looking all over for me and asked what was going on. I told her to keep moving, and we both jogged for a while. When I was absolutely sure we were not being chased or followed, I slowed down and told her the whole story. We decided to report it to the park rangers, but the phone signal was kind of going in and out. It took a while before we could get contact with them. We later caught up with the rest of the group, and I didn't let them out of my sight after that. For the rest of my time at Yellowstone, I didn't see those strangers again. I don't know exactly what was going on there. I'm hoping it was nothing too serious, but I don't really have an explanation for what happened. This happened several months ago. I was at a national park that I had gone to by myself. I enjoy hiking as a hobby, and I don't live all that far away from this area. I went there often and hiked on some of the many trails they have. I remember on this particular day, I ended up getting over 30,000 steps total. By that time, I was done and heading back. I was pretty tired, honestly. The trail I'd hiked on connected to a parking lot that was usually pretty quiet. It was surrounded by mostly woods. When I got back to it, the sun was setting already. I went back to my car and got inside. At the time I did that, my car was the only one in the entire lot. As I got inside, I briefly went on my phone. I was texting back with some of my friends because I hadn't had my phone on for most of the day. I should have left right away, but for some reason I chose not to. I was just kind of relaxing on my phone for a few minutes. I was looking down at my screen, not paying attention to my surroundings. Out of nowhere, I suddenly heard a knocking coming from my passenger side window. I looked over and didn't see anyone there. I was very confused and also a bit creeped out. I kept on looking, but there was nobody there. I looked around the entire parking lot. It was not very well lit at all, and it was dark out now. I still couldn't see anyone outside. I sat up and leaned over to look out of my passenger's window, and when I did, I could just barely see someone crouch down outside. Whoever it was, was pressed up right against the bottom of my passenger side door. Then they tried to open the door. I heard the door handle being grabbed. Thankfully, I'd remembered to lock it when I got inside. When that happened, I immediately put my car in drive and slammed the gas pedal. I started to drive away immediately. As I did so, the person stood up from their hiding place. I could see that it was a big man, but beyond that I couldn't really tell anything about him. To my surprise, he didn't even give up as I tried driving away. He tried to run alongside my car for several moments, grabbing onto the handle and trying to keep a hold of it. As I started to go faster, he finally let go. I saw him in my rearview mirror, standing in the middle of the parking lot. I left and went back out onto the road. Once I was there, I dialed 911 and reported that suspicious man. After that, I was able to make it home without further incident. Since then, I haven't been back to that park. I don't know who that guy was or why he was doing that. It was extremely bizarre. I'm hoping that nothing like that ever happens again, though. During October in our town, there's always this place that opens up with a bunch of fall and Halloween related things to do. It's like a huge fair that's set up on a farmland. I've been there a couple times with my family when I was younger, but this was my first time I'd gone alone with just some friends. We were all in high school and thought it would be fun to walk around and have a few laughs together 
while we enjoyed all the Halloween vibes. The place was open pretty late the entire week leading up to Halloween, so we went on one of those weekday nights at around 8pm. I guess we chose an odd time of day though. Most of the families that would usually be there had already left, and there were only a few groups of kids our age running around the area. Regardless, we had a lot of fun. We played some of the random games they had set up and messed around a bit. One of my friends then said we should check out the corn maze. None of us hesitated to run in and try to get as lost as possible. That was until we somehow managed to split into two groups. Three of them ran off one way, and I was left with just my buddy Micah. Seeing as it was a maze, there was no use in trying to chase after the others. We went our own way for a few minutes, and then started trying to find the way back out. During our ten or so minutes that we spent walking around, we never heard or ran into any of the others from the group. That made us really wonder just how big was this maze actually. At some point, we started getting pretty tired of it. We really started trying to find the way out. Whenever there were multiple paths, we would even split up and check if it were a dead end. Then meet back up and go down whichever one we thought was the best. On one of these random crossroads though, Micah didn't come back. I waited for a long time at least two or three minutes without hearing or seeing from him. Suddenly, I heard footsteps coming from further down the path. I waited for Micah to reappear, but something about those footsteps didn't seem quite right. A moment later, a large man came around the corner and walked right up to me. He was wearing farmer-type clothes, overalls, a flannel shirt and boots. He looked like all the other employees at the fair. He said it was closing time for the night, and he would take me out of the maze. I told him my friends were still in there as well. He said he'd already shown them out, which made everything else make sense now. I followed him, going around multiple turns and corners. Strangely enough, though, the sounds of the fair started to get quieter and quieter until I couldn't hear them at all anymore. It was just me and this man walking through a dead silent corn maze. Eventually, we reached a dead end. I stopped and watched the man pull aside the corn and start pushing his way through it. He urged me to come through with him. I did as he said, walking through it and following closely behind him until the corn abruptly stopped altogether and it turned into a large empty field. I looked around. I realized this was completely on the other side, opposite of the town fair. Right in front of me was a car parked in the grass with its engine running and its headlights off. My breathing became shallow and my heart rate started increasing. Out of nowhere, the man turned around instantly and jumped at me to grab me. I was able to react fast enough to move away and start running back into the maze. I sprinted back onto the path. I could hear the man barreling his way through the corn behind me, following right behind me. I started going straight through all of it, just trying to get back to the fair. Hopefully, someone would be able to help me. This seemed to work, as the man never quite caught up to me. When I made it out, the whole friend group was standing at the entrance, apparently waiting for me. It's not really clear exactly what happened, but Micah said that when he came back for me, I was already gone. None of them saw the man, and almost didn't believe me. That was until I called the police, and they found those tire tracks in the grass. The car and the man were nowhere to be seen, though. This is a story of the last time I stayed in a hotel. It happened over this past summer. I was staying in a hotel a little ways outside of a major city, the hotel itself was decent, and I would say rather nicer than most I remember. After I got there, I checked into my room, 
and then left almost immediately after. I was out for several hours, until a little bit later at night. I finally returned back to my hotel at around 10pm I think. My room was on the second floor, and after I got back up to it, I realized that I couldn't seem to find my key. I quickly found out that I didn't have it on me. Apparently, I had lost it somewhere. I went back downstairs to the front desk and was able to get another one. I went back up and entered my room. I was pretty tired and decided to just go to bed. I got ready and fell asleep within just 20 minutes. Unfortunately, I was not able to sleep for very long though. The next thing I remember was waking up to what sounded like my doorknob turning or something like that. Needless to say, I was immediately confused. Then I heard the sound of the door starting to open. I had no idea why that would be happening. They wouldn't clean my room at almost midnight. I looked over, but I couldn't see the door because of where I was in bed. The bathroom was at the front of the room, so there was a little hallway I couldn't see around the corner. As I got up, I heard the door closing. Moments later, I walked over to where I could see, but nobody seemed to be there. I realized that somebody had just tried to enter my room and then stopped for some reason. I couldn't figure out why though. I didn't know who would do that. I was really creeped out by this situation. I walked over to the door and looked out the peephole. I still saw nobody around. I figured whoever it was had walked away. I was going to go back to bed. When I turned to my left, I faced the bathroom for just a second. All the lights in my room were off, except for a little lamp by my bed. It was really dark because of this, but there was just enough light to see a little bit inside the bathroom. I could see there was somebody hiding in there. Whoever it was was looking right at me. Instantly, I turned back and opened up my door then ran out of the room and into the hallway. I ran down the stairs and back to the lobby. Once I was in the lobby, I told the person at the front desk that a stranger was in my room. They went back up with me, but once we got there, the person was already gone. After that, I decided to get a new room. I moved all my stuff. Luckily, they had an open room on the third floor. The rest of the night was perfectly fine. I have no idea who that person was. I realize now that I probably dropped my keys somewhere in the hotel. Maybe somewhere around it, possibly. This person probably picked it up and then could get access to my room. For some reason, they went into the bathroom instead of just walking right into my room. That's where they were hiding when I saw them. I'm really glad that I decided to switch rooms after that. And I'm also glad I happened to notice that person in that split second when I did. Back in the early 2000s, the old elementary school sat abandoned at the edge of my hometown for months before renovations began. And by renovations, I mean completely tearing the whole thing down and building a new school on top of its corpse. Kind of a morbid metaphor for an elementary school, but it's the most accurate one. Now, something I've got to confess, it was my old elementary school. I was a little bit sad and mad they were going to tear it down. After all, I'd graduated from there and moved on to middle school. In the summer between 6th and 7th grade, I made a plan with my good buddy Troy to have one last expedition to our old haunt. We already knew that was illegal, okay, so don't feel the need to lecture me about it now. The plan was simple, sneak into the school at night and explore every inch of the place, especially the nooks and crannies we weren't allowed to go when it was open like the teacher's lounge and the kitchen. Troy told me he wanted to see if he could nab some leftover desserts from the freezer. I was pretty sure they had already cleared everything out, and even if they hadn't, I wasn't sure it would be safe to eat, 
but I wasn't about to crush his little dreams. I wanted to see what happened behind the scenes in the office. Kind of lame, I know. Pretty soon, the first few weeks of summer flew right by, and the night of the plan finally came at the end of June. Being the sneaky 12-year-olds we were, we said we were planning on spending the night at each other's houses, but instead met up at the local gas station just down the street from the school. The building loomed as large as a mountain on the horizon to us. It was familiar, but also alien feeling. With our hearts pounding, we ran with each other to the edge of the playground. The entire school was surrounded by a very short chain-link fence that me and Troy used to climb all the time, so it was no sweat getting over it now. We played on the swings, the rope climbing thing, and the jungle gym, just like we did in the good old days. Which, you know, were only a couple of months ago, but whatever. Troy did a few fancy flips and jumps off the swing, while I went head first down all the slides. Basically anything we'd normally get in trouble for at recess. I still remember the cold metal ridges catching my shirt and sliding over my stomach as I hurled to the ground over and over. Eventually, though, we got bored of the kiddie playground stuff and started searching for a way inside the school. Obviously, the doors were locked, so we started messing with the first floor windows. You know, looking to see if there were any other way inside. Eventually, I picked up a rock to break one, but Troy quickly stopped me. He said we didn't want to get in too much trouble if we were caught. On second thought, neither of us wanted to crawl in through broken glass either. We soon found that we didn't need to force our way in anyway. A window had been left open after all. One leading right into the library. The space behind the window was nearly pitch black, except for the tiny reflections of moonlight off of book jackets along a shelf. Neither of us moved for a moment. In all our plan-making, our tiny minds never thought the inside of our old school would be so creepy when it was empty. Neither of us thought it would take much gusto to take the first step inside, but there we were frozen in front of the open window. For the first time, I really thought of just how much trouble we'd be in if someone caught us going in. I pictured a spotlight turned on us, and police cruisers pulling up in full force. I know that's kind of irrational for something so minor as trespassing kids, but that's just how kids are when they're young. It was exactly that fear that broke the trance and pushed me to start climbing through the window. And Troy tried to say something, but since I was already halfway in, he knew there was no going back. He kept quiet as he followed behind me. The windowsill was very dusty under my hands. The library carpet sent a cluster of dust right into my face. Who knew just how dirty a place could get after a month of disrepair? I heard Troy cough behind me, and I said sorry. Our voices echoed throughout the quiet library. We looked over the library quickly. That wasn't our main goal anyway. We headed out into the darkened hallway. Troy turned on his flashlight. Once he was sure there was no one milling about, the rows of lockers lit up in the darkness kind of looked like a setting in a horror movie, honestly. I kind of wanted to test and see if my old combination for my lock worked, but Troy punched my arm and challenged me to another race to the cafeteria. We ran down the empty hall. It was so freeing, being able to do all this on school grounds with no teachers to stop us. The cafeteria doors were wide open. And Troy grabbed the door frame as he swung into the room. When I reached him, he was dead quiet though. I stopped to catch my breath, but he didn't brag or even say anything like usual. I finally looked at him to ask what was wrong. My mouth dried up when I saw his face. He looked paler than normal, and his mouth was opening and closing like a fish. I asked him what was wrong. He just pointed his flashlight toward one of the lunch tables. I was not prepared to see someone squatting down behind one and staring at us with these insanely crazy eyes. I didn't stick around to get any more details. 
I could see the guy was older and was holding some sort of syringe. I screamed as he stood up, and we both started to run. I'm not proud to say this, but I nearly shoved Troy to the ground to get out faster. Picture two 12-year-old boys swan diving at an open window, and from there booking it back to Troy's house. That's how scared we were of that guy. We spent the next few days talking everything over. The old guy was probably just a squatter of some sort, and didn't plan on hurting us, but we couldn't entirely be sure. He really looked crazy. We sure as heck didn't want to tell anyone and get in trouble, so we resolved to leave the whole situation behind us. I don't know if the delay in renovations was due to problems with people squatting inside the school, but I can imagine there's a good chance it was part of the problem. I never went back, not even to visit the new school when it was up and running. I, 21 and female, used to live in a really bad neighborhood when I was a kid. Drive-by shootings were not uncommon. The erupts had happened in surrounding houses while we lived there, and before we even moved, we also found out that the sweet man across the street was a registered sex offender. Obviously not a great place for children to be walking around alone, right? True. But if you have a 70-pound good boy that's completely dedicated to protecting you, it's somewhat doable. My mom, little brother in his stroller, me, and Spanky the good boy went for a walk around the neighborhood. It was about two blocks to go to the community pool. I, like most six-year-olds, wanted to wander ahead with my dog. He was always gentle when I held the lead and walked close to me. As we were nearing the pool, there was a stretch of hedges that lined the walkway to the pool entrance. Spanky was walking ahead of me, about three feet or so. He sniffed towards a bush and came to a sudden stop. He began posturing and growling deeply, baring his teeth at this random bush. He had never growled like this before, and to me it was horrifying to see my best buddy like this. I tried to walk around him, but he turned the back end of his body to block me, his eyes still fixated on that bush. I tried again, and he blocked my path once more. My mom was about four houses behind, so she hadn't noticed this strange behavior yet. I could see the bush starting to move, and I took a step back. Mom, I think Spanky found a kitty! I started to take a step towards the bush, but was knocked over completely by Spanky. I was crying on the ground. Scraped elbow, no biggie, but it got my mom running. Exactly at that moment, a man emerged from within the bush and took off running. When Spanky knocked me over, it made me drop his leash, so he immediately booked it after the guy. About 300 feet away, Spanky caught up with him and made some sickening contact with the guy's ankles and forearms. I've heard a lot of screams on TV and movies, but I had never heard such a blood-curdling scream as this before. My mom pulled me close and pulled out her phone, fingers shaking. While she was on the phone with 911, I could hear the man screaming, Get him off me! When the police arrived, they asked for a full version of events, and my mom and I gave details best we could. Mainly her, because six-year-olds aren't great at descriptions, of course. Spanky was sitting very happily at our feet, after the officers and my mom had removed him from the man's arm. The guy was taken away in cuffs. After a quick checkup in the ambulance, they found out he was fine. Just a few real good bites. About ten years later, I asked my mother about it. When I was looking through some old photo albums, I saw a picture of me and Spanky playing in the backyard. She sighed and said, Oh, you know what happened. We don't need to talk about it. Well, yeah, but why would he attack some random homeless guy? My mom made a really confused face. I said, What? That's what happened, right? I guess I can tell you now. I didn't want to tell you back then because I didn't want to worry you, 
The man who Spanky pulled out of that bush had been spotted peeking into the houses in the neighborhood that had kids. It was the same guy that was hiding in the backyard when you had that sleepover at your friend's house. He had a knife he dropped when he ran from the bush. The police thought he might have been canvassing the neighborhood before he decided who to take. If it wasn't for Spanky, it might have been you. So yeah, basically this guy was a footy file that had been spending weeks at night creeping into people's backyards that he knew had children. Most likely, he'd even done worse before. I live 300 miles from there now, and I could still not handle coming up to that stupid hedge if I tried. About two years ago, I was long distance dating a guy who was my first love. He loved me too, but unfortunately due to the long distance and his addiction problems, we had to break it off in the end. As most people react, when their first relationship or love ends, they enter weeks of depression or denial. I had trouble sleeping for at least a month. This caused me to be late to work almost every day, and as a result, I received a warning that if I didn't fix my attendance issue, I would soon be let go. I immediately forced myself to try and occupy my time with freelance illustration and really attempted to go to bed early. The first couple of days, it was pretty rough, but I kept at it still. The first night I remember getting work done and sleeping on time was actually the night this happened. Quick backstory. My roommate and I lived in a house separated into two separate living spaces. One for our friends that rented the upstairs, and one for us downstairs. I figured I should mention this, because our windows, for example, were very easily accessible, and unfortunately did not have locks. We also had a backyard that was fenced off, but like the windows, the fence door was also lock-free. Now on to what happened. I was asleep, but due to being a light sleeper, I easily awoke. When I did so this time, I could see lights coming in through the blinds of my bedroom window. Luckily, my bed was right adjacent to it, so they didn't see me. I was still a little foggy from being sleep-deprived, but I forced myself up. I could hear whispering voices coming from the people who appeared to be holding flashlights. There had to be at least three of them. They were all wearing all black and began to move toward the fence in our backyard. I immediately began to feel so emotional at being woken up that my body kind of went into autopilot. I grabbed my phone and a box cutter. I work at Trader Joe's, where we had to use them every day. I woke my roommate up as well. I dialed 911 and handed him the phone to tell the police some people were attempting to break in. My amazing roommate seemed to understand immediately, despite having been so suddenly shaken awake. I angrily pounded my way to the kitchen, where we had a huge window looking into the backyard. My adrenaline really started pumping as I saw the strangers making their way through the fence. Their flashlights were bobbing everywhere. It was this moment that triggered me into a fit of tears. Not the cute one drop going down my cheek kind, but the kind where rivers of tears came down my face making it difficult to even see. I mean, my boyfriend who I loved left me, I hadn't been able to sleep, the job I loved was threatening to fire me, and now here are these assholes waking me up and trying to invade our home. They began to look through our backyard shed, which like idiots we hadn't attached a padlock to. Inside happened to be a bike my dad had bought for me. One of the intruders made their way to our back door. When through my fit of tears and anger, I beat him to it. I flicked the lights on and swung open the door. The stranger was right in front of me and jumped backward in surprise. I immediately extended the box cutter and started screaming at them. How dare they try to rob someone who was barely keeping it together? I guess the sight of me must have really scared them, because after a couple of moments of them looking at me all crazed holding a box cutter, they booked it in fear. 
The police came and took our statement, and as for descriptions, they said they'd look around. They never found anyone, probably because I didn't follow the strangers to see how they'd got to our place. I could have gotten a license plate or something at least, but it didn't occur to me until afterwards. I also had no worry that they might have hurt me, or more importantly, my roommate. Looking back, I feel really bad about risking our lives like that. I really don't know what came over me. I was holding in so much sadness and anger that these people caused me to let it all out. Anyway, that's what happened. I learned a lot since then, like having our landlord install locks for our windows and seeing a therapist. It may have worked out for me, but anyone reading this, don't be as stupid as I was, especially if there are other people involved whose lives are at stake. I should have waited inside for the police, or yelled at them through the window that the police were coming, but instead I did something quite reckless. It was Atlanta, 2005-ish. My best friend was in town, and she was able to get us a nice hotel room near some bars with her points. Pre-Uber and Lyft, obviously. We got back to the hotel pretty late. It was a bit before midnight. We were intoxicated, but not quite blackout drunk. We got ready for bed, slipped into our jammies, and fell right to sleep in the queen-sized bed. She had accidentally put down just one occupant on the reservation, and we didn't bother to update it upon check-in. Several hours later, I felt myself waking up with bleary eyes. I looked over and saw a figure standing over our bed and staring at us. In my sleepy stupor, I calmly asked, What are you doing here? My friend woke up to the sound of my voice and asked what was going on. The man seemed to be surprised that we had awoken. He told us he was hotel security and there had been a report of a disturbance. He was here to ask us to quiet down. Confused, we told him we had been asleep for hours now. He told us okay and to have a good night. He quickly slipped out the door and we went right back to sleep. The next morning, once we were a bit more awake and sober, we went down to talk with management. We discussed it and realized that something very strange had happened last night. Management talked to my friend then called in someone more senior to talk to her. I was on the phone watching all of this from across the room. As they brought out the second person, and they spoke to her, she became as white as a sheet. There was no on-site security team, and no one had called in any disturbances the night before. They immediately moved us to a different room, and upgraded the rest of our stay. To this day, I wonder if that room was targeted because it was only supposed to have one woman in there at the time. When the person saw there was two of us, they must have panicked and decided not to move forward. I also wonder what would have happened if our reaction had not been as tempered by alcohol and our dreaming stupor state. If we had screamed, would that have triggered something more sinister? A few years back, I found myself driving down a quiet old highway, late at night. I had to travel for work, and sadly, they did not fly me out, so I had to drive there myself. I would get compensated though, which was nice, but I still didn't like such long driving. Now, I had originally planned on stopping in a city and getting a hotel there, but I was making such good time that I drove right past it and kept on going. By that point, I was really kind of winging it. I had no idea where the next major city was. Not even a major city, like a big city, but just a city with a decent hotel and some other businesses in it. By the time it was midnight, I finally started to get really tired. I was now five hours ahead of schedule, that was good, but I had no clue where I was going to stay. I took an exit to grab some gas. 
I figured I could drive for another hour or so if I really needed to, but after fueling up my car, I saw a sign for an old motel just down the road. I'm not too picky, and the motel didn't look that nice, but it honestly could have been much worse still. Without very high expectations, I drove over and booked a room for the night. It was a pretty standard two-level motel, with each room facing the parking lot and opening right up to it. There was a sidewalk in front of the rooms on the first level, and a walkway on the second one. I ended up getting a room on the first level at the far end. After I got the room key, I grabbed my things and headed inside. The room was actually pretty nice, much nicer than I expected it to be. There was a decent-sized cable TV, the bathroom was clean, the room was clean as well. The bed itself was very comfortable. I took a shower and climbed into bed. I decided to watch some TV until I got real sleepy. I would say about 30 minutes later, though, there was a sudden knock at the door. This certainly was very odd, especially at this time of day, but it's not like I was afraid or anything. I really had no reason to be. I got up out of bed and walked over to the door. I opened it slightly, and there was a man standing there. He looked somewhat tall and skinny. He had longer hair and a thick beard. The man said hello, and I asked him what he wanted. His speech was slightly slurred. I suspected there was alcohol in his system. The man asked me if he could come inside for just a few minutes. I don't know why he thought I would just let him into my motel room. Obviously, I said no and shut the door right in his face. After that, I could tell he was just standing there. I hoped he would go away on his own. I went back over to my bed and sat down. I glanced over, but eventually I couldn't see the guy anymore. I hoped that he really had left by now. Thirty seconds later, another knock at the door again. I yelled at the man to go away and leave me alone. I walked over to the window and looked out of it. I saw him walking away on the sidewalk in front of the rest of the rooms. I was thinking to myself that I hoped he wouldn't bother the other people there. Hopefully nobody let him into their room either. I sat back down on the bed. Five minutes after this, I noticed movement out of my window. I looked over and saw the man was back again. He was standing right outside and holding what looked to be some kind of pipe-like object. I really didn't know what it was. He swung it at my window. It made a really loud noise, but the window did not break. He started hitting it several more times, and eventually I heard the glass starting to crack. I realized this guy must be insane. He really was going to try to get in. I had nothing to fight him off with, so I got up from my bed and grabbed my phone, keys, and wallet. I ran to the back and got inside the bathroom. I locked myself in there while I heard him slamming the window repeatedly. Eventually, I heard the glass breaking. I called the police and told them what was going on. They said they would get there as soon as possible. My only fear was the guy would somehow manage to break down the bathroom door. This was a somewhat cheap motel, so I wasn't sure how good the quality of the door itself was. After he finished whacking out the glass of the window, he made his way inside. I could hear him breaking random things in the room. He smashed the TV, he began bashing the walls. He was just breaking everything. I remained hidden in the bathroom. Soon, though, he made his way towards where I was. He smacked the bathroom door several times, then went back into the other area of the room. After another minute, though, he walked back to the bathroom. I heard sirens approaching. I knew it was just a matter of time before the police got there now. The sirens didn't seem to bother him at all, though. Instead, it seemed to aggravate him even more. He began hitting the door more fiercely. The police arrived within a minute. Soon, I finally heard him stop breaking things. The police were able to grab him, and I came out from the bathroom. I saw the room was all torn up. He'd certainly succeeded in doing some damage. At least he didn't do damage to a human being, though. After that, I obviously had to get a new room. 
The rest of the night went by pretty well, though. The next morning, I was back on the road. That was by far my craziest hotel experience. For a little bit of background, I'm a woman, and this took place last year. I was staying in a hotel for a few days. I had a room on the second floor, and the hotel was very large but not super fancy. They had a good breakfast that was free for guests, and was on the first floor. There were a lot of things I wanted to do in the city I was staying in. I had several friends in the area, and I was excited to visit with them. After arriving the first day, I spent some time with those friends, then returned to the hotel. I pretty much went straight to bed that night. The next morning, I got up and went down to grab some breakfast. It was pretty busy, and a lot of other people were also grabbing food. I sat by myself in a small table in the corner. I was next to a window, but I was facing the rest of the people there. While I was sitting, I noticed there was this one guy who was just kind of staring at me. He was sitting across all the way on the other side of the room. This guy was also sitting by himself. At first, I didn't think he was looking at me. Perhaps he was looking out the window behind me. I looked around, but there wasn't really anything else there to look at. For some reason, I got the feeling he was staring at me. He looked away a few times, but his eyes always returned to me. It was so often, too. He wasn't smiling or anything, he just kept a straight, dead face. The man appeared to be somewhat young, average height, and somewhat on the thinner side. He was wearing a black short sleeve shirt and black pants, and didn't appear to be ordering or trying to eat anything either. He was just kind of sitting there staring at me. I stayed there for another 10 minutes or so, then decided to just go back to my room. I was in my room for maybe an hour before leaving and meeting up with some of my friends again. I was gone basically the entire day. I didn't arrive back until real late, probably around midnight or so. After getting back, things were very quiet inside. I noticed, though, that just past the lobby in the breakfast room, the same guy was still sitting there. He was at the table just kind of looking around. When I walked by him to reach the hallway, his eyes snapped right to me. It was strange to see him again, especially after all this time and at this hour. After I passed by him, I went to the elevator and took it up to the second floor. Then I walked down that hallway to my room. I entered and took a shower. I was going to go to bed when I got really thirsty and realized I didn't have any water. I really didn't want to drink water directly from the sink in the bathroom. I just personally hate drinking tap water. I knew there was a vending machine down the hallway though, so I decided to go out there. When I got to the door, I got this feeling that I needed to look out the peephole first though. I really don't know if I can explain it. When I did so, I saw the same man, the one who had been staring at me at breakfast, and again when I got back to the hotel. He was standing silently outside my door in the hallway. I had no clue why he was there or what he was doing. I watched him for about ten seconds. He just kind of stood around. I quietly moved away from the door. I was creeped out and didn't know what to do. For a few minutes, I was just trying to figure out what the guy could possibly be doing. I was trying to think of any logical explanation in my head, but I couldn't really find any. After about five minutes, I went back over to the door and looked out. He seemed to be gone. I very carefully opened the door and looked both ways down the hallway. The coast appeared to be clear. I walked down to the end where the vending machines were. As I was getting my water, it was extremely quiet. When I finally grabbed it and started walking back to my room, I suddenly heard footsteps sprout behind me. They were a ways back, but I began to move as fast as I could. When I was about halfway to my room, I looked over my shoulder. 
the same guy was back there. He was still a fair distance away, but he was definitely coming right for me. I continued to move quickly to my door. My heart was now racing. I knew that if I had any kind of mishap when entering my keycard, a man would immediately catch me. And we all know that hotel keycards can be really finicky to get to work sometimes. I made it to my door, and thank goodness the card worked on the first try. I got inside and swiftly slammed the door shut in one fast motion. Just a second later, the doorknob started to turn back and forth. It was locked though. I looked out and saw the guy standing out there. Just what on earth did he want from me? After that, there was a quiet knock on the door. Obviously, there was no way I was going to answer it. Instead, I went to the phone. I called the front desk and reported the man. I gave his description, and I was told they would look into it. I waited inside my room. About a minute or two later, I looked out through my peephole. The guy was gone. I could see a hotel employee walking down the hallway. I left my room and told the employee what had happened. He said he would keep an eye out for the man. After that, I went to bed. It took a good while to fall asleep, but eventually I was able to. The next morning, I was told by hotel management that they had located the man. He was still in the hotel. The previous night, when questioned, he ran. However, he did not leave the place entirely. He simply hid somewhere inside the hotel. He was later spotted hiding in the breakfast room behind a table. The police got called on the guy, and eventually he was arrested for refusing to leave. When I heard that, it was a huge relief. It was crazy to find out that the guy wasn't even staying at the hotel at all. It was just a random guy hanging around and causing problems. I still don't know why he targeted me specifically. The rest of my trip went great, but the experience stayed with me. It still creeps me out whenever I remember it. So this happened when my sister and I were kids. We went hiking in the woods in our backyard in North Carolina. We only had a few neighbors around us, and our house was surrounded by woodlands. It was a Saturday afternoon during the summer. My sister and I decided to go hiking alone together. We did that quite frequently. We were both under the age of 10, but our parents allowed us to do this. We loved exploring the forest and discovering new places. As we made our way through the woods, everything was fine at first. When we went to our favorite place where we usually hung out though, something didn't quite feel right. I got an uncomfortable feeling immediately, like something bad was going to happen. I looked around at my surroundings, but I couldn't see anything or anyone. My sister and I continued walking through the woods, until suddenly we heard leaves crunching behind us. We heard a twig break as well. Immediately, we turned around to see what it was. There appeared to be nothing there. We initially thought it was just an animal because of this. As we started hiking again though, we heard leaves crunching once more. This time, when we turned around a bit faster, we could see someone running and hiding behind a tree. As we looked closer, we could also see their shadow coming from behind it. This was clearly a person, definitely not an animal. We both looked at each other and felt paralyzed by fear. We started freaking out and thought this person was going to try and grab us. I gripped my sister's hand and told her to run. We ran as fast as we could back home. Once we made it there, we ran inside and told our parents about what happened. Our parents immediately became worried. They said from then on, we were not allowed to go hiking alone. They would come with us and protect us. I don't know who it was that was following us, but it still freaks me out to this day. I don't know what that person would have done to us if he'd managed to catch up to us while we were running away.
this was a particularly short encounter. But a few weeks ago, I was working a closing shift with a female co-worker. She was trying to lock the door, but the key was real shitty, and so it wouldn't lock properly. I was doing some other work, when all of a sudden I heard her desperately screaming my name. I ran over to see what was wrong. There was this homeless man outside. He was looking right at her, and he was sprinting right for the door. I mean, fully sprinting without any regard for anything else. I held the door shut as the man slammed into it, and she managed to properly lock it. The man gave us a nasty look and banged his head against the door a few times before turning around and running off. I don't know what exactly that guy's problem was. What did he want? Did he just want to scare two young girls working the night shift? I'm just glad I'm leaving that place soon for a better job. I'm not going to give my name or age, but I need to talk about a story that still impacts me to this day. First of all, my parents separated when I was nine years old. A few months later, my mother met a guy who I'll call Kevin. At first, it was going very well. He played with my brother and me, he was really nice to my mother. It was like that until my mother got pregnant by this guy. When she told us, we were really happy. We were going to have a new sibling in the family. It must be said that at that time, I was seeing my father every other weekend, and despite everything I tried, he was going to be moving away from my brother and me. Suddenly, I had major abandonment wounds. Anyway, after my mother told us she was pregnant, she started looking for a new apartment that was a little bit bigger to accommodate more people. She quickly found one, but not in the same village where we were. We moved quite quickly and changed schools, too. I was quite unsociable at the time, which meant it took me a long while to make new friends. After nine months, my mother was in the hospital and gave birth to a little bean. At that point, things with my stepfather started to get really weird. For example, he started to throw insults aimed at me. I remember being locked in the bathroom for a good hour, with this guy on the other side of the door, telling me that if I came out, I would be dead. He started threatening to hit me and everything. At that time, I was 11 years old. My brother was not at home, as he was still in class. After the hour locked in the room, I finally came out when I no longer heard any noise outside. When I left, I went straight to my room, so as to not run into him again before having to go to school the next day. My mother, returning with the newborn, seemed to calm everything down, but it didn't last for long. So began a daily life for me punctuated with insults and the insinuations that my only use in life was to die. In this apartment, we decided to adopt a cat. This is a detail that stood out to me for a lot of reasons. So we adopted this cat and he was very adorable and super cuddly. Unfortunately for him, being a baby still, he accidentally relieved himself on a sweater that belonged to Kevin. Since then, my stepfather began throwing him against walls and various other forms of violence. Eventually, my mother, brother, and I had to leave for ten days. My mother decided to hand our cat to someone else, so we would not find it dead when they returned. About a year after that, we moved again this time to be in a house. Things became much, much worse and much harder for me to bear. This man, if we can still call him that, started to put hands on me and forced me to sit on his knees as well. All while he started acting inappropriate toward me, he also began treating me like crap. I remember one sentence he said to me several times. The first time he threw it in my face was when I was getting yelled at for something I didn't even know. Being hypersensitive, I was in tears under the table when he said with a frightening composure, Why don't you just die? No one wants you here. Go kill yourself, damn it. 
After hearing that, I tried not to think about it anymore. He started to get violent with my mother as well. He began to be drunk all the time. Whenever he left for work in the morning, he often came into my room, thinking I was still asleep, but it woke me up every time and had me laying there in fear. Despite my complaints to my mother, she never did anything about it. At that time, I no longer spoke in school, for fear of getting yelled at just like I did when I was at home. I was very distant from everyone and tried to act like everything was fine. Things continued like this until their child started school. My mother decided to separate from this man and move back to the first village we initially lived at so the child could start school there. I remember just before moving, him taking me to the side, and before dropping me off, he said this to me, Why are you mad at me? I never did anything to you. I'm gonna talk about the repercussions this man had on me, besides two times attempting suicide and stays at the hospital. After they separated, I had insomnia every night. I could only sleep three hours a night, waking up every ten minutes. I was seen by three psychologists for many years until my first suicide attempt. Eventually, I was diagnosed with depression and discovered that I was hypervigilant at night. I'm still currently in severe depression and being sought after by psychologists to help me. It started in fifth grade. I wasn't a complex kid. I didn't have a phone, didn't use social media. I only had a tablet I could only use for certain times of day. My parents weren't super strict, and since I played outside all the time with my neighbors, I didn't really mind. It was to keep me from getting addicted to online games and developing a short attention span. To be honest, I'm grateful for the restrictions in hindsight. It made my peers' job of stalking me much harder. Anyway, there was a kid in my class named Damien, and he was kind of weird. I didn't know him for long, but he was the worst sort of boy. He'd pull at girls' bra straps in the middle of class, whoop at them, and tell the teacher the girls were always distracting him. He'd even tattle on you for everything, especially if you didn't include him in something. That's how all this started, at the beginning of October of 5th grade. My best friend at the time, who I'll call Jane, had a strange sense of humor like I did. She didn't have any electronics at all. When we were younger back in those days, there were these fake chat stories that were all the rage over YouTube. I wrote down a bunch of them with glitter pens and was going to give them to her the next day in class so she could have something fun to read that evening. Then we'd joke about it together the next day. In comes the annoying, irritating, obnoxious little boy Damien. He threw a fit about not being able to look at this present for my friend. It got to the point where I simply looked him in the eye and said, It's about girl stuff, Damien. You wouldn't want to read it, unless you want to know how periods work. Obviously, I was lying, but the kid demanded to read it anyway, as if he had a right to my personal belongings. I laughed at him and asked my teacher to use the restroom, so I wouldn't have to deal with him anymore. Surely, he would calm down while I was gone. Apparently, while I was out, though, Jane saw him rooting through my bag. He pulled out my gel-colored pens and started writing nasty things into the little packet I was going to give my friend. It was a bunch of inappropriate stuff about murdering, killing, fucking, and various other cuss words that would be considered inappropriate. When I came back, he ran to the teacher and tattled on me. He said I was threatening to kill his family and murder his friends if he told someone about it. Lo and behold, my teacher snatched the gift I was going to give to my friend, read through it, and then looked at me with anger and sent me to the office. Long story short, my parents were called, and I was suspended for three days because of Damien's lies. They said I threatened to harm another student, even though I never did. 
All the while, my friend kept telling him that Damien did it. Along with this, they also ended up giving me a whole two months worth of detention, two hours before lunch every day. This was all because as I was talking to my friend, Damien decided to eavesdrop on our conversation and said I was spreading nasty rumors about some other girls in my grade. He said I wanted to hurt them. All I was doing was telling Jane some things I'd heard other girls saying about her. That was the second strike on my record. That's why there were so many detentions. My school was very strict. Now that I have some basic explanation out of the way, I can continue the main story. After both those instances, Damien continued to find little things to plant on me or rat me out with lies, really just bugging me in general. He went as far as to spread rumors that me and my best friend were lesbians dating, but I was cheating on her with another girl. I was straight as could be. I didn't really care about the rumors, but I was annoyed he'd rope my friend into it. Finally, it all came to a head in the next semester. We used to have to take 541 tests all the time, and on our little sheets we wrote down our scores and signatures from the teacher. We had our names and addresses on them as well, so they could send them to our parents at the end of the nine weeks to show we were on track. Apparently, Damien copied down my address while I wasn't looking at one point, and proceeded to convince his parents to get their driver to go by my house to say hello to his friend. He would yell insults at me and throw mean notes into my yard. He was rich, by the way. He took pictures of me while I was outside playing with friends and showed me the next day with a quip that I couldn't outrun him and that he knew where I lived so I better not make him mad. It got super creepy when he started to print out the photos of me and put them all in a little binder. I told my teacher and the principal about it, but they just told me that boys will be boys. That I shouldn't be looking into his private folders without his permission like it should be allowed for him to take photos of me without my consent. You could even clearly see in them that I didn't know they were being taken. Even my own parents didn't believe me, saying I was just making it up to blame the kid that got me in trouble. I wasn't lying at all, but the adults all thought I was because I'd gotten into so much trouble that year, with little fault of my own. He kept harassing me, taking pictures, leaving things in my yard and my backpack, he even messed with me during tests at the computers. He would always sit too close to me in class, watch me at recess, and try to grab and touch me all the time. No matter how much I complained or told adults around me, they told me to be happy that a boy liked me that much. This kept happening all through sixth grade, and when it came to my first middle school dance, he got even worse. He tried to take photos of my dress, tried to steal one of my heels as well, and tried to steal money from my purse. I'm pretty sure he'd developed an obsession with me, as distorted as it was. He would comment about my body during the gym class we shared. He even began to complain to the teachers that I didn't wear shorts that showed off my ass enough when we got older. I remember him talking about how nice it was to look at me with a bloody nose and messed up hair. This is after I ran into the bleachers when playing Capture the Flag, and tried to snatch it from his hands. He jumped up onto the bleachers out of bounds and tripped me, causing me to slam my head into them. That hurt like a bitch, mind you. After that comment, I tried telling the principal again. He didn't care, so I stopped trying. He continued with the behavior to the point that most days I couldn't bring myself to go to school. I would hide in the gym, locker room, bathrooms to avoid going out after roll call. I just didn't want to interact with him. At the end of seventh grade, he was caught with cigarettes, so his parents sent him off to military school. I bring up this whole story that was so long ago, because recently he began trying to add me again on my socials. Obviously, I blocked him, but even now, nearly five years past that initial attempt, he still tries to get in touch with me. I don't think I'll be prepared for a day I have to see him again.
when me and my siblings were kids, there was this guy who'd park in the lot next to our house and watch us play or whatever. I can't remember if I was the only one who actually noticed him. I don't remember all of this part because I was four or five years old. I was soloing some pretty serious playtime in the front yard right next to the road. Probably pretending my little Hot Wheels were spaceships or something. All of a sudden, the dude parks right next to me out of nowhere, jumps out, and tries to grab me. My mom was thankfully paying close attention and immediately flew from the house to confront the man. When he saw her approaching, he let me go, and he fled before she could reach him. He never came back after that. Honestly, for a long time, I didn't even think about this or what was actually going on. Retroactively, about 30 years later, I've really managed to creep myself out. I remember one day, one of my friends said he had something really cool to show me. He led me over to a rabbit burrow underneath a shed, when all of a sudden he came up from behind me. He put me into a firm chokehold and started suffocating the life out of me. I did the only thing I could. I reached out for help from the only other person that was there, but he just stood there smiling at me. After a minute or so, the one guy chokeholding me let me go. I have no idea to this day why those two did that to me, but I'm eternally grateful they backed out before they actually killed me. After that, I left and never talked to either of them again. I, 25 and male, was around 13 or 14 years old when this happened. I used to sleep over at my cousin's house almost every single weekend. We'd spend the entire weekend playing video games until the early hours, and weird things always seemed to happen around those times. He lived with his family in a huge two-story house, and even though it was fully furnished, it felt eerily empty. Strange noises and odd half-sightings were common, but as kids playing late into the night, getting spooked by the dark was normal and most of it was just our minds playing tricks on us. One time, my cousin went to take a shower in his bathroom. I decided to use the master bedroom's ensuite since his parents were away. It was just the two of us in the home. I entered the bathroom in there and locked the door and started my own shower. During my shower, though, I heard a strange noise and peeked over at the door. And that's when I saw the door slowly creaking open, revealing someone peering in. Due to the small gap in the door, I couldn't really make out the person's face. My innocent mind thought to myself, oh, I must have left the door slightly open and someone accidentally pushed it. I confidently exclaimed, it's occupied. The door didn't close though. It lingered open for a while until the person on the other side slowly slid it closed. When I finished up my shower and tried to leave, I realized that the door was actually locked and the only way to lock it was from the inside. That was the last time I slept over at my cousin's house. To this day, I have no idea who or even what opened that door on me in the shower. A few months ago, I was walking about a block from my house. When I turned the corner, I noticed three men standing by a white pickup truck. For a split second, I saw two of them talking to the third in a hushed tone. The third man, a smaller Asian man, began walking quickly past me, carrying two suitcases. He grinned at me as he walked by. As I approached the area with the other two men, they started to ask me, why don't I help Mr. Chang there carry his luggage? They insisted he had many miles to go. 
Mr. Chang, by the way, was walking up what I knew to be a dead-end street. I was already pretty creeped out, so I apologized and explained that I was 17 and didn't have a car. They insisted that I could simply walk with him and carry his luggage. I told them I was busy and tried to get away. They started yelling at me, screaming at me for not helping him, and began to follow me. I pretty much just ran the hell out of there at that point. The whole interaction was just so surreal and very off. I don't know if I can adequately explain just how scary it was at the time. I met a guy at uni while smoking weed in my car. I saw him rolling a blunt and he asked if I wanted to join. I said of course. We started doing this every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Fast forward three months later, we started becoming better friends and things started getting personal. He told me he was with the Navy in a high security clearance type of job. He started describing all these crazy stories which I'm sure he shouldn't have told me. That's not the scary part though. What was real creepy was the fact that when he was telling me these stories, he pulled out a knife and began playing with it. As he finished, he locked the doors and got this real creepy voice. He also had this strange look on his face. He pointed the knife at me and asked me if I'd ever been stabbed before. After he finished smoking, I told him I had to go right now and study for a test, and after that I never saw him again. Several years ago, I bought a used car on Craigslist. I'd been driving a pretty old car that I loved for a while. Unfortunately though, it eventually broke down and the repairs would cost more than the car itself was worth. I decided to just get a new car. I went on Craigslist because I feel like the best deals are there. I didn't need anything brand new. I was looking for something a bit newer than my ancient car though. Something a little bit more reliable, I guess. I remember when I first started looking, I saw a newer listing that seemed almost too good to be true. I looked it over and saw almost no information in the post itself. It said that the car ran well and the miles were relatively low. So I contacted the owner immediately. I knew that such a listing would probably sell fast. It had been made just about 30 minutes prior. The seller got back to me quickly saying that I could see the car that same day if I wanted. I agreed, then went on and met them at the back of a Target parking lot. I looked at the car which appeared just like in the ad. The seller was a guy who said his name was Jim or something. He was about average height, dark brown hair, wearing sunglasses and a big hat. I went for a short test drive with him down the nearby highway. The car seemed to run perfectly fine and the miles checked out to what the ad said as well. I didn't really know why the price was so low, but I couldn't find anything wrong with the car currently. I bought it from him right then and there. It was crazy that I bought a car so fast. That was literally the first day I was looking for one. After I got the car, I drove back to my house. I lived alone in an average-sized home. The next day, I decided to go out and clean my new car. With it being used and all, I figured it would be a good idea to do a deep cleaning. Even vacuum the inside as well. I first cleaned out the back area, then was doing the front. When I was cleaning the front passenger side seat, I was vacuuming it. When something weird happened, the seat sort of moved. I was getting in the crevice, and the bottom part that you actually sit on kind of shifted around. I felt around and tugged on it, then the entire seat lifted up, revealing a secret compartment. Inside was a bunch of cash. I couldn't believe my eyes. I really didn't know what was going on. I took the money and went inside my house. There was a bunch of $20 bills as well as 50s and 100s. 
I counted it all out and it added up to a little over $10,000. I called my friend and he came over to see it. We talked about what to do and ultimately decided to give it back to the previous owner. We didn't even know if he knew about the money. Maybe it belonged to whoever owned the car before he did. I would think that if somebody knew they left over $10,000 cash in a car, they would remember to take it out before selling it. The same night, I went out to my car and examined it closer. Unbelievably, I found four more secret compartments. Some beneath the other seats, one in the center console. It was like the whole car had been customized for this. However, none of the other secret compartments had any money in them. They were all empty. Still, it didn't feel right to keep this money, and there was something weird about this car. I was just sitting there debating between calling the police and calling the previous owner. Ultimately, I decided to tell the owner. It was nighttime though, so I was going to wait until the next day. That same night, something weird happened. I was in my bedroom at probably 11 o'clock or so. I wasn't trying to sleep yet, but I would be going to sleep shortly. That's when I heard a noise coming from outside. I couldn't tell what it was, but it seemed like someone was out on my property. I left the bedroom and headed to the living room that had a window to the front. I carefully looked outside and saw there were two men standing in my driveway. I couldn't tell you a good description of them. It was really dark out there. I just saw they were walking around my new car I had just bought. It looked like they were trying to open one of the doors. I watched one of the men suddenly smash the front passenger side window. I realized then that it was probably the guy who had sold the car to me. Who the other guy was, I didn't know. They broke into the car, and I watched them go inside and search it. I would have just given him the money back if he'd asked me. He didn't need to break in. I called the police at this point because something was clearly off about this. The men were inside my car searching for the next few minutes. I sat on the ground in my living room, waiting for the police. I saw them leave my car and start to walk to my front yard. When I saw this, I started to panic because they were going right toward my house. I didn't know what to do, so I went over to the light switch and turned it on. When I did this, I couldn't see outside very well anymore. But the men appeared to move away and shift over to the left. I went over to the window and looked out. That's when I saw them leaving and walking away down the street. I was glad to see them gone. The police still weren't there though. I waited about two or three more minutes until I finally saw police cars pulling up. I went outside and met them and let them know what had happened. My car window was smashed. But I didn't have anything valuable in the car at all, so nothing was stolen. I showed the police the hidden money I'd found and gave it to them. After answering a few more questions, the police left, and I was able to go back to sleep. The next day was very normal, actually. I didn't get any more information from the police, but that night something else happened. I was actually sleeping this time. I was awoken at midnight. Instantly, I had the feeling those guys were back. I got up from my bed and went to the doorway. What I heard was a strange sound at my back window, on the other side of the home. I didn't hesitate. I called the police immediately and locked myself in my bedroom. I then hid inside the closet. I didn't hear anything else. Obviously, I couldn't try to stop the guys from breaking in, if that's what they were going to do. Inside the closet, I couldn't really hear anything. It remained mostly quiet, until soon the police arrived. They were much faster this time than the previous night. When I finally came out of my hiding place, I saw the police had captured the two men. It was the same guys from the previous night. They had just broken part of one of my back windows to the house. Luckily, they didn't make it inside yet. I found out the guys were in fact the previous owner of the car and had gotten the money illegally somehow. I'm not sure if they robbed a bank or what, I didn't find out, but that's why they were selling the car so cheap, to get rid of it, that's also why the money was in it. 
I guess those morons must have forgotten to empty that compartment of part of the money, though. It was a crazy story, but I'm glad that everything turned out okay in the end. A year ago in early winter, I went hiking for a weekend in a national park, not far from home. It was supposed to be the last few days of good weather, before the winter cold and snow came in. I wanted to get out while I still could. There was a trail my buddy had told me about that went up to a nice view of a lake. It was not a crowded place, so I decided to try it out. When I got to the trail, it wasn't quite what I expected, though. There were no signs or markings at all. There was just this thin, narrow path going off through some trees. I walked down a little ways, and while it still had no markings, it seemed like a pretty straightforward trail to hike along. As I walked, it was clear that few people ever came this way. There were almost no shoe prints in the dirt and the path didn't seem professionally made. This didn't frighten me or anything, mind you, but it was just something I took note of. The forest along the path was really nice, though, full of wildlife and falling leaves from the changing season. Just a beautiful sight. About a mile in, I walked past something rather interesting, though. Another path leading off this one out into the woods. I stayed on the trail I was on. I didn't really understand why there would be another path connecting to this already rarely used trail. As I kept on walking though, more of these random side trails started to show up. They shot off in random directions, leading to what looked like nothing in particular. It was really odd. After about three hours of walking the trail I was on, it just ended. There was no more path to follow. All that was ahead was an endless row of trees and forest. Out of nowhere, I heard footsteps behind me. I whipped around to see a guy walking in the distance. He had a ripped up jacket and no backpack. And strangely enough, he was walking across the trail I was on down one of these side paths. It didn't look like he'd seen me. He was just looking down and walking. The way he walked, though, and how he looked was a bit eerie. I did my best not to be seen as I watched him disappear into the woods. By now, it was looking like there wasn't much daylight left. I decided to just abandon finding the lake and hike back to my car. It took me a few minutes to reach an intersection of paths I didn't remember before, though. Immediately, I thought about how the path I was on had ended so abruptly. Now, I knew that probably meant that at some point, I'd gone down the wrong trail somehow. I looked down, trying to see if there were any shoe prints of mine I could follow, but I didn't see any. I once again heard footsteps behind me. I turned and looked out into the forest. In the distance, the same man was standing there, facing me. He didn't move or say anything. He just stood there watching me. After a moment, a chill ran through my body. I turned to take whatever trail was in the opposite direction of this man. I hurried, checking behind me multiple times. After a few minutes, I'd lost track of the man. I went down this trail for over an hour, worried about being completely lost with this strange man apparently following me. After a while of walking, I moved off the path and leaned against a tree, taking a break to drink some water. Not even a second later, I heard those same footsteps yet again. I slipped behind the tree where I was and tried to hide. The sound of shuffling steps got louder and louder until the man walked right past my hiding place. He looked focused on the path ahead, like he thought I must still be walking. There was no doubt in my mind at this point that he was following me, or at least trying to. Once he'd passed me by, I took the opportunity to run back the way I'd came, getting to the intersection once again. I chose between two other paths. 
Thankfully, I made the right choice, because halfway back to where I thought my car was, all the light faded, and all I had was dim moonlight to guide me through these woods. All I can say is that man I saw didn't look like he was out there for just a hike, and based on the way he was acting, I think he may have had some terrible intentions that I may have just barely avoided. This happened just a few months ago. I live alone in a house in what I would describe as an average neighborhood. One night I was by myself and in the living room just relaxing and watching TV. It was 11 o'clock at night. And that's when I heard my phone vibrate, the specific vibration it does when you receive a text. I was curious and picked up my phone to look at it. When I did, I saw that a new number I didn't recognize had texted me. The text simply said, Hey, I'm outside. This seemed bizarre right off the bat. I figured right away it was a wrong number. I thought about replying and saying so, but I decided not to do that. I simply tossed my phone aside and forgot about it. Maybe ten minutes later or so, I was still watching TV but I thought I could see something out of the corner of my eye. My living room is at the front left side of the house, and there's a side window that looks to the outside. Some bushes by it were being moved out there. I looked over and saw what looked like a person walking past the window. I couldn't make out any details about them because it was so dark out, and it was a long ways away. In fact, I only saw them for a split second. I wasn't even 100% sure about it. Maybe I was just being paranoid. It really looked like someone had walked by my window, though. Now I suddenly started thinking about that text again. Could it have not been just a wrong number? But somebody actually at my house? Who would this be, though? Why? I had no clue. I decided then to text the number back and asked them who they were. When I did, they responded almost instantly. Come outside and you'll see. I was really creeped out. I had a feeling that this person really was outside my house. For what reason, I didn't know. I got up from the couch and looked out the front window. My front yard appeared empty. I closed all the shades and went around to all the different windows in the house. I went to the sides and the back as well. Everywhere I looked, I saw nothing. Of course, there were several places around the yard where somebody could hide without being seen. I had no idea where this person was. I walked back into my living room, and just as I did so, I heard a knock coming from one of the back windows. Instantly, I had a bad feeling about it. I walked back over to the dining room, where a window that looked back out into the backyard was. Whoever had knocked on the window was now in hiding once again. I looked all around back there, but I couldn't find this mysterious person. I went back into the living room and texted the person back. Why were they at my house? Why were they doing this to me? And the person texted back immediately again. Once again, they said, Come outside and I'll show you, or do I have to break in? I texted back saying that I was calling the police and proceeded to do so. I told the 911 operator that someone was threatening to break into my home and I had reason to believe they were on my property already. I was told that officers would be there in just a few minutes. Then I just had to wait, hoping that the person wouldn't actually try to break in. In the meanwhile, I didn't get any more texts from that number. I thought about messaging them again, but decided not to. Only five minutes later, the police arrived. I saw the cars out front and went outside and talked to them. They searched my property and all around my house, but unfortunately they did not locate anyone there. As the police were still there, I got another text from this number. I can see the police there. It showed a picture of the police. They looked around the street, but we couldn't see anyone. They looked around for another 20 minutes, but the person was never found. 
After that, they left. I was really creeped out by this, but luckily and surprisingly, I didn't get any more texts after. I also didn't see any more creepy things outside or people skulking about my property. Looking back, I still have no idea who it could be. Sometimes I think that maybe it was one of my neighbors, but that seems sort of far-fetched. I don't know. I'm still left wondering about it to this day. I spend a lot of my spare nights doing deliveries for DoorDash. It's my way of getting some extra money, while also not needing to commit to a more strict second job. I started driving around 9pm on this night and steadily took on orders until around 11. It slowed down a bit during that time, so I just kinda drove around the shopping center that had the most fast food restaurants people often ordered from. Eventually, another order came through. It was a regular order to be delivered about four miles away. After grabbing the food, I started the directions to the address. It was almost immediately apparent that this wasn't a house it was being delivered to. I zoomed in on the map, which only showed streets and buildings, and the address I pointed to was along a street that had no buildings on it whatsoever. It looked kind of like an empty plot of land, actually. The DoorDash map was never that great, though, so I just started driving and decided to at least check it out before I wrote it off. Maybe I'd call in to the customer if there was really an issue. I drove out there taking just under 20 minutes until I reached the street it was on. The street was very bare. There were no houses or crossroads, no cars driving on it. When I got to the end, it became a gravel road. Off to the side was a small wooden sign that was too weathered to even be legible. I pulled onto the gravel and turned my brights on. Right away, I could see something far off down the road. I drove in closer, and as I approached it, my phone dinged to let me know I'd arrived. In my headlights was a small mobile home, or some sort of RV. On the door were some poorly painted numbers. I looked back at my phone. 2760. It was the address. I got out holding the food in my hand. As I walked up to the RV, getting a closer look at it, it was a bit unsettling to look at. It was completely overgrown and old, which was strange considering it was a mobile home. Those were meant to be moving around, right? I gave it a knock and waited. This was a rare cash order, which made more sense once I saw the place, but I definitely didn't feel good having to stand there. As I looked around, an eerie feeling washed over me. This place was surrounded by woods, with no lights anywhere past the RV. It was complete darkness out there. I heard something from inside, and prepared for them to open the door. Then, a voice off to my right startled me. I looked over, and saw a man just standing there smiling at me. He was by the corner of the RV. He asked me if I had his order. I nodded and apologized, walking it over to him. I handed it off and set his total. The man reached into his pocket and pulled out a $5 bill. He smiled again and said he just needed to grab the rest. He turned around and walked back around the RV while I stayed where I was. This whole interaction in writing doesn't seem as off as it was in person. But I can tell you, just by looking at this guy, I could tell something was very wrong with him. Something about the way he was acting and saying things. It just gave me chills. I waited for a minute or so, before getting more and more nervous. I peeked around the corner to where he said he'd gone. In the distance, I could see a figure, standing by what looked to be the dark outline of a shed. They were not moving at all. They were just standing there. As the fear grew inside my head, I jolted around. Hearing the door to the RV suddenly opening, a different man looked out at me. 
Just as I started to greet him, he slammed the door shut. My heartbeat was now intensifying. I looked back out at the man who was by the shed. He was walking back toward the RV, but now he had something different than money in his hands. I couldn't quite tell exactly, but it looked like he was carrying a rifle. I ran back to the car and jumped in. I turned it on with shaky hands and slammed it in reverse. The man came running around to the other side of the mobile home and then stood calmly in the darkness as I drove off. I don't know exactly what was happening there, but I wasn't exactly keen on finding out. I went straight home afterwards and debated calling 911. I was caught up on the fact that I didn't actually know what was going on, so in the end I made the regretful decision to not notify the police. Whatever happened that night remain as just the strange encounter it was, with no answers to the true nature of it. Last year, I had a really creepy experience. For a little background, I live by myself and have a house. This was the same situation for when this story occurred. It all started when I was at home one night. It was around 9 or 10 p.m., I think. Usually, I stay up kind of late, so I wasn't about to go to bed anytime soon or anything. When I suddenly heard a knock on my front door, I did think that was a little unusual. I walked over and looked out the window to see who it was. There was a woman standing out there. I was unsure if I should answer the door or not. I waited to see if she would just walk away on her own, but about a minute later she knocked on the door again. I decided to answer and see what was going on. I opened up the door for her. She had long blonde hair and looked to be in her 20s or so. She was wearing a black sweatshirt. Immediately as I opened the door, she asked me if she could come inside. I asked her why, and the woman responded by saying there was some guy that was after her. I told her I could call the police for her, but she interrupted me and asked to come in again. I didn't let her. I suggested calling the police once more, but she simply said no. When I asked her why, she just turned around and walked away. Needless to say, I was pretty confused. I looked around trying to see if there really was any man outside searching for her or something. I didn't see anyone. The woman quickly hurried down the street and out of my sight. I went back inside after that and then went to bed later. By the next day, I had completely forgotten about that encounter for the most part. I went to work as usual. After that, I was home again. It was later at night once more. I was in my living room when I happened to notice out of the corner of my eye in the window that someone was out front walking by it. It was the same woman from the night before. She was walking on the street in front of my house. I knew a lot of my neighbors, and I was not aware of this woman living in the neighborhood. I had never seen her before until the night prior. It was also unusual for people to walk on my side of the street in the first place. This was overall a very strange situation. When she arrived in front of my house, I saw her stop and look at it. I noticed that she seemed to be kind of idling and staring at it. She then seemed to notice me looking through the window at her. She kept walking past my house down the street over and over. I wasn't sure who she was or why she was hanging around my neighborhood all of a sudden. I thought maybe she had moved in down the street or something, but honestly I had no idea what this was. I saw her again the very next day. This time I was driving to work. I remember that after making it out of my neighborhood, a car was driving behind me for whatever reason. I looked at my mirror to the car behind me and saw that the driver looked an awful lot like the woman who I kept seeing. I was almost positive it was her, but she was wearing these gigantic sunglasses, so I couldn't quite see all of her face. I couldn't be 100%. It was strange to see her again, though. At first, I didn't even have the thought that she was following me in her car in my mind. 
but as I kept driving, I noticed her making all the turns I did. Eventually, I was 90% of the way to work, and she was still right behind me. Now, I was 99% sure it was the exact same woman. It took me 15 minutes to get to work, and when I got there, she pulled into the parking lot right after me. I was shocked. I knew she didn't work here, but when I drove to where I always parked, she drove through the lot a different way. Her car went out of my sight. I couldn't tell if she was parking or just driving away. I went into work and didn't see her for the rest of the time that I was there. I didn't see her when leaving either. Actually, for the next two days, I didn't see her at all. I became even more suspicious because of this. I kept glancing out my windows at night, trying to see if she was lurking about somewhere. I didn't see any sight of her. One night a bit later, once again I was home by myself, except this time it was much later at night, probably after midnight. I was actually just about to go to sleep and was lying in bed when I heard a loud noise coming from what sounded like outside, right near the back of my home. I got up and went to my doorway, and that's when I heard another loud noise. It was clear it was coming from the back window. Somebody was hitting it with something. I didn't know who it was or what they were doing, so I stayed in my bedroom and closed my door. I then called the police and told them that somebody was trying to break into my home. A short time later, I heard more loud noises, and it sounded like someone had made their way inside my home. I stayed in my room and quickly locked the door. Whoever was inside my house walked around, but I soon heard them opening every doorway. They didn't get close to my bedroom, though, before I stopped hearing any noises. It took me a while to realize they'd likely gone into my basement. For the next five minutes or so, everything was silent. Then the police arrived. I ran out of my room to let them in. Once they entered, I let them know I thought somebody was in my basement. They went down there, and a short time later came out with the same woman who I'd kept seeing. I should have known it was her the whole time. I was glad she wouldn't be bothering me anymore but I never got an answer as to why she was doing all this. She refused to say, and in the end, I never found out anything more. I wanted to share this story to warn people. It's a story that's really weird and freaked me out. I'm traveling around the country in my car, I've been driving for over a week from the city I lived in, and so far I've slept in my car to save money. It wasn't until I got to a big enough city that I decided to treat myself to an actual bed that would be comfortable. I opted to choose Airbnb because it's cheaper than hotels. I booked this particular Airbnb the day before I arrived to the city, so there weren't many options. I had found this apartment that looked very new and modern. It was in a great location, and the price was decent as well. Actually, it seemed almost too good to be true. The only downside was that it was listed as a new listing, and so it had zero reviews. I figured the price was low because it was a new listing, and decided to give it a shot. It must be legit because it's on Airbnb, right? When I got to the apartment building, it was older looking than I expected. I later found out that my Airbnb was most likely the only renovated apartment in the entire building. The rest seemed to be in very poor condition. It looked like a dorm hall more than an apartment building, really. I let it slide, though, because I wasn't paying too much, so what could I really expect? The apartment itself looked like the pics, so that was good enough for me. Everything went well for the first two days. As a woman traveling alone, I always make sure to be safe. I don't go out when it's too dark. I always lock the door. I lock every single lock, including the chain. Anyway, on the third day, I was out all morning and came back to the apartment to change to head to the beach. I had again locked the door, including the chain. I was in front of the door watching TV while changing, 
when all of a sudden the door started to unlock and someone tried to open it. I was beyond lucky I had remembered to put the chain lock on the door, or else it would have opened right away. I was naked, and no one else was supposed to have keys to this room. My first reaction was, excuse me? I closed the door right away and locked it again. I didn't see who was trying to open it while I did this. I sat in front of the door scared and shocked. I realized this person could still get in there any time, since obviously they had a key to this apartment. At first, I thought maybe it was the owner coming back after I checked out, but I was not supposed to check out until the following day, so that couldn't be it. After crying for a few minutes, I recuperated myself. I called the owner and told her what happened. She told me that no one else was supposed to have a set of keys other than her, and that she was at work and she couldn't possibly be there. I was scared to stay in the apartment, because someone could come in at any time. I also didn't want to leave though, because I had all my valuables there. It was a lose-lose situation really. I called my dad who told me it was not okay that someone had the keys, and she needed to take care of this ASAP. He talked to the owner, and she told me she would be there shortly with a locksmith to change it and give me a new pair of keys. She proceeded to tell me that she had only had this apartment for six months, and before I'd stayed there, there was only one other Airbnb booking. She mentioned it had been sitting empty other than those two bookings because she had been renovating the apartment. She told me the only possibility for who it could be was the previous owners or someone related to them. I'm pretty sure that's illegal. That possibility really messed with me. How was it possible that I was gone all day every day, and in the ten minutes I happened to be home during the daytime, that was when someone tried to come in? How did they know I was there? Were they coming to rob me, or something else entirely? If this apartment had been sitting empty for half a year nearly, maybe this was something they did frequently, or maybe they wanted to do something to me in particular. These questions are constantly on my mind. I just know I'm lucky I put the keychain on the door, or else. I don't even want to think about what they could have done to me. Needless to say, I will not be leaving a good review, and I won't be staying in an Airbnb that has no reviews, or seems too good to be true from now on. I remember I was at a party when I was four. I was with my parents when a random guy came up to me, claiming to be my uncle. He said he wanted to show me something out in the woods, just down the road from the house. He grabbed my hand and started dragging me until we reached a clearing in the woods. All of a sudden, my mother appeared out of nowhere. She had apparently taken note and been following us the entire time. She grabbed me up and ran back with me to the party. She later told me to never go with people I didn't know, even if they said they were relatives. I cringed thinking back about what might have happened had she not followed us that night. I remember I was driving someone home at night. I was in high school at the time. It was a week night and not many people were out on the road. We were almost there when all of a sudden, I saw a woman standing in the middle of the road holding something. My friend yelled and we all started to freak out. It turns out she was holding a huge knife. She tried to take a swing at the car as we passed by. We called the police, obviously, and I had to drive by again on the way back. They were talking to her, and she was still holding that big knife in her hands. I didn't find out what the story behind this was, but it was a super scary experience, being a new driver and seeing that late at night. I, a 20-year-old, 118-pound woman, used to work at a museum with some pretty expensive exhibits. I'd usually get in pretty early, 
7 a.m. or so while it was still dark. The security guys would get in about 30 minutes before me. One day, I was heading toward the entrance. It was really quiet. No one around except this one weird skinny homeless guy. He was walking pretty close to me, but the museum was surrounded by a public park, so I didn't really think anything of it. As I began to unlock the door though, he suddenly sprinted up to me and asked me in a really hurried and nervous way if I had the time. As I looked down at my watch to check, another three guys ran up out of nowhere right to me. They all violently attacked me and forced me to the ground, then forced their way in through the entrance and started to drag me behind. They kind of did a double take as they got inside and realized there were security guys everywhere. They all quickly ran right back out the way they came. I think they wanted to attempt to either rear or kill me and then rob the place. They thought I was the first and only person there, but they didn't realize the security guys were all already inside. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in the comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys, so thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.